In the name of God. Hi everyone, welcome to EKG Land. I'm really glad to be here with the first episode of EKG Land. My goal for making these videos is to help you learn EKG by heart. In this land, we're going to explain any kind of EKG you think from basic strips to challenging ones in a simplified and amazing way. Let's start with the first EKG strip. This is our today's strip, from a 21-year-old male with prior history of type 1 diabetes, complaining of new onset atypical chest pain since two weeks ago. Before getting down to the heart of the matter, remember that the best way, to make a flawless interpretation is using a 10-step approach. This approach consists of, standard calibration values, heart rhythm, heart rate, axis, P waves, PR interval, QRS complexes, ST segment and T waves, also known as STT changes, QT interval, and finally, overall interpretation. Let's start with the first step that is standard values. Every EKG strip, must be properly calibrated so that we can make a proper description of wave morphologies and intervals. Standard calibration values consist of, EKG speed and voltage. The EKG speed, is ordinarily 25 mm per second, and the voltage is considered to be 10 mm per millivolt. Note that, using calibration marker is a better and faster way to check standard values. We expect the calibration marker to be two large boxes tall, and one large box wide, and as you see, the calibration marker here is standard. So, this is a standard and acceptable strip. Second step is cardiac rhythm. Heart rhythm analysis is the most important, sometimes most challenging and most time-consuming step in EKG interpretation. Every heart rhythm result from the association between atrial activity, SA node function, and ventricular activity. The electrocardiographic definition of heart rhythm is, the relationship between P waves and QRS complexes. Note that, according to the definition, the prerequisite for rhythm analysis is, examining P waves and QRS complexes but not necessarily in details. We will talk about P and QRS in 5th and 7th step in details. In general, cardiac rhythm is classified into two main groups, regular, and irregular. We define three independent steps for heart rhythm analysis. First, locate and examine P wave morphology. The best leads to identify P waves are, D2, V1, and other inferior lead in order of importance. In this strip, arrows are showing the P waves. They are morphologically identical and upright in D1, D2, V3 to V6, and negative in AVR. This establishes the rhythm as originating in the sinus node. Remember that. Sometimes the P waves are buried within QRS complexes and T waves, and which makes it very difficult to mark them properly. In such cases, it is highly recommended to scrutinize, all 12 leads to look for the evidence of P waves and atrial activity. Second, locate and examine QRS complex morphology. Again, I emphasize that in rhythm examination, it's not necessary to examine QRS morphology in details. At this level, our main questions are whether the QRS complexes are morphologically identical or not? And are the complexes narrow or wide? Here, the complexes are identical and narrow. Third, describe the relationship between the QRS complexes and P waves using PQRS ratio and intervals, including, RR interval, PP interval, and PR interval. The PQRS ratio and intervals, are determining factors in order to discover the actual relation between QRS complexes and P waves. Here, the P waves are associated with QRS complexes in a one-to-one -one fashion, and the PR interval is stable. There is no drop beat, so the AV node is healthy and no AV block exists. PP interval and RR interval here, are variable and considered to be irregularly irregular. In summary, the rhythm is sinus with normal AV conduction, and irregularly irregular narrow complexes, due to the variability in RR interval. Therefore, the underlying rhythm is sinus arrhythmia. Third step is, calculating heart rate. There are several methods to calculate heart rate, which mainly depends on the underlying rhythm. If the rhythm is irregular like our today's EKG strip, count the number of complexes within 6 seconds, that is 30 large boxes, and then multiply by 10. Here, are 7 QRS complexes in 30 large boxes, so the heart rate is 70 beats per minute. If the rhythm is regular, use one of the following methods. One way is to divide 300 by the number of large boxes between two R waves. Another method of heart rate calculation, 
is to divide 1500 by the number of small boxes between two R waves, which is the most accurate method when the heart rate is regular and fast. Next step is, axis analysis, the best leads to localize heart axis are, leads 1 and 2. Remember that, the normal QRS electrical axis ranges from minus 30 and 90 degrees in adults, and happens when both leads 1 and 2 are positive. An axis between minus 30 and minus 90 degree is considered left axis deviation, and occurs when lead 1 is positive, but lead 2 is negative. If the axis is between 90 and 180, then right axis deviation is present, and happens only if, leads 1 and 2 are recorded negative and positive respectively. Finally, an axis between minus 90 and minus 180 degree is termed, northwest axis or extreme axis deviation and occurs when both leads 1 and 2 are recorded negative. In this strip, lead 1 and 2 are positive, so the axis is considered normal. Next step is, examination of P wave, before going through the P wave, remember that P wave and QRS complexes, are helpful in discovering heart rhythm and many other structural and non-structural abnormalities. That's why, we are supposed to examine P and QRS two times, once for axis determination and the other time for other abnormalities in a detailed approach. Let's come back to P-wave examination. The P-wave represents atrial depolarization. The duration and amplitude of normal P-wave, is generally considered 3 and 2.5 small boxes respectively. Here, both the P-wave duration and amplitude are two small boxes, so no particular RA or LA abnormality is present. When the dimensions of P-wave exceed the mentioned limits, atrial abnormalities, like LA or RA enlargement are possible. Duration greater than 2.5 small boxes, represents LA abnormality, while the amplitude more than 3 small squares results from RA abnormality. Next step is PR interval. The PR interval include the P-wave and the PR segment as well. It extends from the beginning of the P-wave, until the first part of the QRS complex and represents the period of time for atrial depolarization and conduction through the AV node in the Hisperkinji system. Note that, the length of the PR interval varies with heart rate, and is normally 3 to 5 small squares. Here, the value of PR interval is stable and within normal ranges, which means that the AV node functions normally. Let's go through the seventh step, the QRS complexes. It represents the time for ventricular depolarization. We recommend to analyze four items when examining QRS complexes. First, QRS duration. The entire QRS length normally lasts for 1.5 to 2.5 small boxes. If QRS duration exceeds 2.5 small squares we call it wide. Second, QRS amplitude. Look for any evidence of low or high voltage complexes. The QRS is said to be low voltage when the amplitudes of all complexes and limb leads are less than 5 mm, or the amplitudes of all the precordial QRS complexes are less than 10 mm. On the other hand, increased amplitude of complexes favors ventricular hypertrophy. Ventricular hypertrophy criteria will be thoroughly discussed elsewhere. In general, this strip is neither low nor high voltage. Third item we talk about, is our wave progression and transition zone. Normal R wave progression, is defined as R wave progression across the precordial leads with transition zone in lead V3 or V4. In this strip, the transition zone is taking place in lead V3 and therefore is normal. The last item in this step, is looking for pathologic Q waves. Note that not all Q waves are pathologic, and not all pathologic Qs are because of infarction. Unfortunately, there is no consensus on the definition of pathologic Q. We're going to elaborate on pathologic and non-pathologic Q and its differential diagnoses in next videos. In our strip, there is just a small non-pathologic Q in lead 3, and is off no clinical significance. Next part is, ST segment and D wave, and is so-called STT changes. They occur after ventricular depolarization. ST segment is the time of electrocardiographic silence while the T-wave represents the period of ventricular depolarization. Remember that, the junction between the end of QRS complex, and the beginning of SD is termed J-point. J-point plays an important role in detecting SD elevation or depression. On the other hand, there is a fundamental misunderstanding about the baseline. Some of us think that, PR segment is the baseline, 
and we must compare SD segment with PR segment to detect any SD elevation or depression. But that's wrong. The truth is that, TP segment is the isoelectric line, and SD changes are determined using TP segment. Here, as you see, there is no significant SD elevation or depression. You might see some slight SD elevations or depressions. These are not clinically important, and considered as normal variations. We will talk about different normal variations later. And what about the T waves? As you might know, T wave is due to ventricular depolarization. Among electrocardiographic waves, T waves have the most normal variations, ranging from diffuse flattening to tall waves. Even diffuse T inversion can sometimes be normal. In general, in EKGs with absence of depolarization abnormalities, including bundle branch block, WPW and ventricular hypertrophy, T wave is always inverted in AVR, mostly inverted in V1, sometimes inverted in V1 to V3 and usually upright in other leads. Here, in AVR and V1 it's inverted. In other precordial and limb leads it's upright. Therefore, there is no abnormal STT changes in our strip. Next step is QT interval. The QT interval is made of up QRS complex, SD segment and T wave. Therefore, it's measured from the very beginning of the QRS complex to the end of the T wave, and represents the time elapsed between ventricular depolarization and repolarization. Since the QT interval is dynamic, and changes with heart rate, it's essential to correct our initial calculation based on the heart rate. Several formulas are proposed to correct QT interval, including Bazet, Fredericia, Framingham, and Hodges. Among all these formulas, I personally prefer Hodge's formula because of its convenience. This is Hodge's formula. Let's see how it works. Our QT in long lead is nearly 10 small boxes, and every single small box is 40 millisecond, therefore the QT is 400 millisecond. Now we must correct the QT using Hodge's formula, and finally, the corrected QT of our strip becomes approximately 417.5. Note that the normal range of QT is, 360 to 450 for men, and 370 to 460 for women. Our last step is, overall interpretation. Before going through this part, if you have enjoyed this video till now, please subscribe me and ring the bell for further videos. In order to interpret our EKG properly, we are supposed to make a list of abnormal findings. In this strip, the only abnormal finding we have, is the irregularity in heart rhythm. Therefore, our EKG is, sinus arrhythmia. Let's have a brief and to the point overview on sinus arrhythmia, and its clinical significance. Every irregular heartbeat, is called an arrhythmia. Sinus arrhythmia is categorized as an irregularly irregular heart rhythm, and is considered present when the variation in the PP interval is three small boxes or more. As the name implies, atrial activation in sinus arrhythmia occurs via sinus node. There are three types of sinus arrhythmia. 1. Respiratory or phasic, 2. Non-respiratory or non-phasic and 3. Ventriculophasic sinus arrhythmia. Respiratory sinus arrhythmia is a common and benign phenomenon, that is due to oscillations in cardiac filling during respiration. It is associated with obesity, diabetes, and hypertension. On the other hand, it becomes less prominent with aging. During respiratory cycle, inspiration reflexively inhibits vagal tone leading to an increase in sinus rate, while with expiration, vagal tone restores, and the heart rate declines. Interestingly, this type of arrhythmia disappears with breath holding. To put it in a nutshell, respiratory sinus arrhythmia is benign, and doesn't require any extra cardiac evaluation so do our case. Remember that, non-sinus arrhythmia is less common, typically occurs in elderly people, and as the name reveals, this type of arrhythmia doesn't have anything to do with respiratory cycle. It is more likely to be associated with cardiac problems, including detox and toxicity as well. So unlike the respiratory type, further evaluation and cardiologic consult is recommended. Never forget that as long as the EKG is concerned, respiratory and non-respiratory sinus arrhythmia are indistinguishable. However, patient history and physical examination are very helpful. Remember that, our case is a young man, so respiratory type is much more probable. The last type is ventriculophasic sinus arrhythmia that is mostly associated with AV nodal blocks. We will thoroughly explain it elsewhere. Thanks a million for watching this video. Again if you liked this presentation, 
please subscribe me and ring the bell. Have fun.